hey, sorry guys, I'm gonna try this again because someone called me and then like since my computer and my phone talk, it like messed up the feed. Um, no, oh, I'm texting someone back. We have. Um, so yeah, like I said, the study from the VGM, I will put the link in comments. Really cool study, the effects of a low carbohydrate diet on energy expenditure during weight loss maintenance randomized trial. Um, another really cool thing, hold on, copy. I wonder if I can copy from my phone. Paste. No, that's not it. Well, I'll look it up later. Um, okay. Yeah, it's so weird how the phone thing. So that study was really informative. And like I said, awesome Like takeaways from the study is that lower carbohydrate weight loss, like weight loss from a lower carbohydrate diet, increased energy expenditure. So it was easier to maintain the weight loss. I didn't read this specifically in the study because have you guys tried to read those things? They're dense. But my theory from like common sense and how I know how keto works, right? Because when you eat a lower carbohydrate diet, your body burns fat for fuel. Is that because the body was probably burning body fat for the energy, right? That it was missing, like that it wasn't being eaten because they did have the, they did have the participants on a caloric deficit. Quite a big one, which of course, you know, I'm not super into that. But because when you're burning fat for fuel, your body's taking those calories from your stored body fat. That's probably why the energy expenditure in these people didn't drop like the contest, like the participants on a high carb study because their body was still getting those calories. It was just getting it from stored body fat, which how awesome is that? Um, because as we know, if any of us have yo-yo dieted, which raise your hand if you've been, you know, in the past, um, you know, especially with like, I was actually, so in my fitness pal app, I've had my account forever. And if I go back a few years, like ago, I have a little chart of, I did Weight Watchers after my son was born. And when he was like six months old, I tried Weight Watchers. Um, and I had done Weight Watchers in high school and I remember I lost some weight in high school with Weight Watchers. I lost like 30 pounds, but I, I was like, I'm going to do it again. And Weight Watchers had changed their pro their program. Um, so you could do it online and there wasn't a point system. Um, really was there still a point system? I forget. It was definitely different. And so I did the Weight Watchers and I used my fitness pal app to track and, um, all their food, you know, point, all that was in there and I gained like my little weight chart went over the course of three or four months. Um, I put on like 20 pounds. And of course, although it was I was successful in high school, um, my, you know, a high schooler, like my life wasn't stressful, but with a baby and metabolic damage and adrenal issues and autoimmune issues like that, um, you know, I remember Weight Watchers stuff like avocado, like an avocado would be like all my points for the day, but then I could eat like a bagel and it would be fine. So obviously they really favored higher fiber, higher carb, and then low fat. That was definitely the, the Weight Watchers model. And I gained weight doing that um, and struggled for a long time to get any amount of weight off my body. Um, and although I had been overweight most of all of my life, really, I remember never struggling so much, like doesn't matter what I did. And I was nursing this baby and I was trying to eat healthy and I would restrict, restrict, restrict. And then I would binge on sweets and I was baking cakes for like, um, I was baking smash cakes for people like my friends in San Diego. And I would eat a lot of gluten-free, but baked goods with maple syrup, with maple syrup is what I used to sweeten it mostly. Anyway, and I just remember, um, I also tell people, I didn't gain a lot of weight when I was pregnant. And I think the reason for that was because I was already overweight when I got pregnant and I didn't want to get um, gestational diabetes. So I was very careful um, with what I ate and I remained very active during my pregnancy. However, I gained 35 pounds in the two years postpartum. Um, and I tried all the ways I knew how to lose weight and nothing worked. The calorie restriction, the weight watchers, the shakes, drinking smoothies instead of eating meals. 
anyways, and I'm all sure all of that really wrecked my body. Yeah, so low carb lifestyle works usually. The thing about the body, the body's always gonna we always have some amount of glycogen. Like there's no there's no like there's no like there's always like four grams in our blood and our and our body works really hard to make sure we always have that like amount like there's a very specific amount of um of glucose that we need to have in our blood at all times to like function and so but it's a very very measured amount and so our body like our body really likes us to be between 70 and 90 um and so i think that when we go over which if you're eating standard american diet you're constantly over um like 90 and you know milligrams per deciliter and then so that's going to have, that's going to spike your, that's going to get your HP axis. So it's really incredible how much insulin is connected to our cortisol, like to our central nervous system. And it's, and pretty much if we go too high or too low, our body's going to get the pancreas and it's either going to release insulin or it's going to release glucagon. And so when our body is working on like the insulin cycle, as I call it, um, is when we're overeating carbohydrates, which most of us, like if you're on a standard American diet, you are. And so what happens then is your blood sugar goes really high. Um, your body's like, oh my God, this isn't good. We're going to end up like in a coma <laughs> or whatever. It freaks out. Um, and so then the, the central nervous system tells the pancreas to release insulin and then insulin takes that, um, the glucose in our blood sugar and takes it to the liver and stores it as glycogen. It takes the extra stores it in our muscles as glycogen. And then the rest goes and is stored as fat tissue. So it gets stored as body fat, which is why when you eat, when you have an excess consumption of carbohydrates over time, it's, you store a lot of body fat. Now on the opposite end of that, when our blood sugar goes too low, it again sounds an alarm bell for our body. And this is really our survival mechanism. Like this is also why, why we can get into ketosis so when our blood sugar goes too low we the same thing central nervous system sends alarm bells going off and then it's like you know what is it like the pituitary gland and it releases i don't know what some hormone and then it, the adrenals release cortisol and then the cortisol and then our pancreas releases glucagon and glucagon is our friend it's a little hormone we like it so what glucagon does then it goes and it turns the stored glycogen back into glucose right in our liver and then it goes into our muscles and turns that glycogen back into glucose so pretty much it wants to get sugar back into the bloodstream but this is really interesting um when you're low carb you don't have glucose stored in your liver so when it goes to your muscles and it turns that glucose it, that glycogen back into glucose the glucose in our muscles doesn't go into the bloodstream, so it doesn't raise our blood sugar. Our muscles use that locally, which is kind of, I think, why carb ups work for um, for uh, like athletes, right? But then, once since that blood sugar, right, that doesn't work, and that's why gluconeogenesis. And people would argue that you almost need protein to help you get into better ketosis or a deeper state of ketosis because, um, like gluconeogenesis protein right the protein being broken down into glucose actually raises glucagon like it kind of supports that function but anyway and then glucagon that's also going to go into our fat tissues and make our and have our body use fat for fuel and the glucagon is what helps our body break down the stored body fat to use as fuel so that people are always like just they talk about ketones a lot but glucagon is like what's making the magic happen in our body so glucagon is our favorite little hormone and it's interesting when you learn about this and when I was learning about this in school and it's kind of like, well, isn't that a stressful thing for your body? And I would argue that because obviously my classes don't teach this specifically for like the mechanisms of ketosis. I actually like ended up calling a bunch of my friends who have like masters in nutrition and like, and I was trying to explain like what I want to know what is the metabolic function that makes us fat adapted? Like, is it that we're kind of living on this glucagon cycle versus g going back and forth? And I think it is. I think that once you're fat adapted, your body kind of prefers that, like the glucagon to, you know, you're, you're tapping into that versus, versus insulin more often. Um, 
but our body always uses some measure of glucose. Like even, like I said, even if it's not like, even the glucagon will take the stored stored glycogen, turn it into glucose. We need a certain amount of blood sugar always. Um, but yeah, it's really cool because the great thing about a lower carbohydrate diet, and I think what's really interesting is that people have a hard time wrapping their head around the fact that when we say low carb, it doesn't always have to be as low carb as what we think keto, as what keto is, like, or what traditional keto is, like 5% of your, you know, intake or 20 grams total. Most people will still get the benefits of a stable blood sugar with a reduction of carbohydrates in our, in their diet. Because when you look at the standard American diet templates, 11 grams, I mean, 11 servings of grains a day, that's, Mind blowing, like who, eleven sir. Like how do you, who? How many times a day are you eating? <laughs> like so, even just on a paleo template or a whole foods template, or you look at a lot of other healthy civilizations in the world that do some, you know, maybe some legumes or they're sprouted or whatever. They're not eating them like they're not over consuming carbohydrates, and so they're they're healthier. Um, and I think that that's the main thing. I always tell people if it's like scary to you or if you feel like you can't, you don't do so hot, you know, with super, super, super low carb, that's fine. You could still have the benefits and the blood sugar regulation. And just by reducing, which means, you know, sugars, processed, refined carbohydrates, um, you want to like, you know, starchy vegetables are, they can be very good for you, very healthy, you know, mic micronutrients and prebiotic benefits. But of course, if you're having like loads of starchy vegetables, with every meal, maybe you're kind of mimicking the standard American diet, but with paleo friendly foods, when really a paleo template is anywhere between 20% of your calories to 40 or 50% of your calories from vegetables and tubers, you know, not 60 or 70 or whatever standard American diet would be. Um, and I think about that a lot. I think, and in my, in my studies, a nutritional therapy program, they talk about this a lot. Like, it's okay to say there's certain rules that kind of apply to human beings across the board as what is beneficial to us. And it what's beneficial to all human beings is eating unprocessed food, eating enough fats. Like there's a fatty acid deficiency in our society because we got this like in the nineties and eighties, there was this fat phobia and people stopped eating fat and they're scared of eating fat. And like, I, I would even argue that some people don't digest them well because their bodies like, you know, kind of forgot how. And the crazy thing about there's certain essential fatty acids and while our bodies produce some of it, omega-3 and omega-6, there's this really important balance because omega-3 and omega-6 help our bodies create prostaglandins, which they, they, create, they create inflammation in our body to help our body heal but then they also are anti-inflammatory. So first your body, let's say when you get a cut, gets red and swollen, it's helping your body heal, but your body naturally from the omega-3 and the DLAs also has other prostaglandins that's gonna help reduce that same inflammation. But when you have an imbalance there because you have a fatty acid imbalance, which comes from not eating proper amounts of omega-3 to omega-6, which small segue is why it's really important to have a balance there, right? Most Americans eat way too much omega-6, which is the pro-inflammatory fat, and not enough omega-3, which is the anti-inflammatory. But that's then why you have a ton of people who are taking NSAIDs and um, non-steroidal, anti-inflammatory, whatever. What those do is they block the prostaglandins. They block the enzyme that creates the prostaglandins in our body, which is crazy. So instead of letting your body use its natural function of he, the inflammation is there to protect your wound or whatever it is, right? And then the body has its own anti-inflammatory thing. So not only is our diet skewed, but then we're taking these medicines and over-consuming these medicines, right? I would say that there's a time and a place, but there's this over-consumption. Like anything hurts, pop a Motrin, pop an aspirin, pop you know Tylenol, instead of figuring out the root cause. So they're really, it's all tied together. This like, we have this pro inflammatory diet with full of, you know, oxidative fats and grains and way too much carbohydrates. And we're riding this insulin roller coaster and, you know, chronically stressing our body out because what happens is, you know how I was just talking about 
um, the, I was just talking about <clears throat> the glucagon, right? And how when your blood sugar crashes or goes too low, you get that glucagon cycle, which, and yes, cortisol kind of, you know, is the start of the release of the glucagon cycle. But that's when you're a sugar burner and you go from the sugar high to the sugar low, like, like two hours after you have a donut and you feel like crap and that your blood sugar goes, because insulin tends to overcorrect, right? You eat, your blood sugar goes up to 200 because you just had a bagel and coffee with cream and sugar. And then you're in, your body's like, insulin, 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 insulin. We have to get rid of the sugar in our blood. We have to put it away. We have to store it in the liver and the muscles and the fat tissue. But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, too much, too far, too far, too far. And then whoosh, we crash. And then cortisol, our adrenals are like, the adrenals are, glands are like, release cortisol, get the glucagon out, get that sugar back into the bloodstream. It's really this like dance, right? Because we have this narrow window. However, when you're fat adapted or eating a lower carbohydrate diet, instead of having these crashes, you're just riding this nice little wave, right? Um, and because your liver glycogen is essentially depleted, um, you're burning, you know, stored body fat. Um, and, oh, I forgot my train of thought. <laughs> I know I was talking about the prostaglandins. Oh, right. And so we're, we eat this diet, right? This diet that's full of oxidative fats, hydrogenated vegetable oils, seed-based oils, which are made using extreme heat and chemicals. And the crazy thing about a lot of these seed-based oils, guess what? They oxidate easily, which means that under fat, under high heat, these fats turn rancid. And rancid um, oils have free radicals. They have unstable uh, like atoms. And so uh, they're, they, they're, they're carcinogens essentially. Um, so it's just crazy how we, we, we were told to eat in a way that made us sick. And then we were told to take medicine that just counteracts our body's natural ability to heal. And then now humans are like, I don't know, we were better off a long time ago. Try, sorry, I'm trying to read your comments. Oh my God, trying to tell my husband the food pyramid is so outdated, it's impossible. He loves his carbs. I mean, Julie, the interesting thing is that I will say, historically, and if you look at nutrition from an anthropological point of view, there is no one right way to eat, right? Excuse me. So carbs aren't bad. I mean, my husband eats a ton of carbs, but as my, but he's also an avid cyclist. So like, let's look at, um, activity level is super important in correlation to higher carb consumption. I think, um, like Chris from Chris from is the fastest cyclist in the world right now. He's the top cyclist out there. This guy is in ketosis. He's a keto and he, he, you know, he's an endurance athlete. So being fat adapted is really great for his longer rides. This guy rides hundreds of miles, maybe 200, 300 miles a week, right, training. He eats about 150 grams of carbs a day. You tell any normal keto person that, and they're like, hell no, that's not keto. For Chris Fromm, it is, because he is burning that glycogen like this. Like, think about explosive, explosive muscle movement. Exp like, it's, for our body to get energy from fat, it takes a little bit longer, right? Because it needs, cortisol actually isn't the first uh, line of defense. Our adrenals release epinephrine first. And so like, that's going to be, um, like sugar, like when that happens, sugar is a faster, like glycogen is, is like, especially liver glycogen is going to be the fastest form of energy available to you. So if you're a CrossFit athlete, or if you're like I said, someone who's just a lot, like I'm talking like a lot of working out, like you're going to burn through that glycogen so fast in those, during your workout, in those movements that the rest of the day, you're going to be burning fat as fuel. You're still going to be fat adapted. Your body's going to have that metabolic flexibility. So I'm, like I said, there's no like one right way to do it. I think that when you look at genetic makeup, you know, medical history, if you, your body responds really well to insulin, you can do those things. The, the reason why low carb has kind of taken a hold of the mass of the masses of it's gotten so popular is because most of most Americans today are pre-diabetic. Like 
like insulin resistance or almost there or type two, you know, like these things, like it's a widespread epidemic. And so it's an overcorrection for the overconsumption of carbohydrates that we saw in the last, you know, 20 years, 30 years. And if you look at the studies of Dr. Weston A. Price, right, the physical degeneration, he would argue that these things can be passed down. Like, unfortunately, you know, my parents who grew up in the 60s and 70s and 80s, when fat was bad, saturated fat was bad, like I've inherited that, like that degeneration, you know, and so I'm still working on fixing that, if that makes sense. Um, like our gene expression, our epigenics can be passed down. So that's kind of where that theory comes from. But there isn't one right or wrong way. Um, it's just right now that's the hot topic. Um, why, why keto is so effective or, or, you know, low carb. And some people are like, oh, but I could never do that. And that's fine. If you feel like you don't have to, you don't have to. But a lot of people are seeing the benefits of it because of where we've gotten today. Um, yeah, I mean, humans are super adaptable. Our bodies are crazy, crazy machines, and they adapt to anything. It's just either you adapt well or you adapt poorly, and you're kind of crippling your system. And I think that there's a divide there with people who, you know, live out their lives eating whatever they want. <laughs> and then there's the rest of us who obviously we found our way. You know, you're here on my page. It's paleo and gluten-free and dairy-free and all those things. And so maybe you didn't do so well with standard American diet, like, like this girl. <laughs> so anyway, um, I think it's just important to realize that it's not about being dogmatic about it. I eat carbs sometimes. I mean, I like to be fat. I'm fat adapted. Um, I definitely do better on a low carbohydrate diet. I do better on a low carbohydrate diet because I am insulin resistant. Um, because when I eat too much sugar, I have inflammation in my body. When I eat too much when I eat carbs that turn into sugar in my body all the time, I get brain fog, I get fatigue. And again, inflammatory symptoms, I gain weight very easily. Um, I eat low carb because it makes me feel good. And I eat really well. And I'm not psycho about it because I also know that the carbohydrates I do choose to include in my diet are whole food carbohydrates. I'm not eating grains or refined sugar. I'm not eating, you know, Chips Ahoy or... I don't know, McDonald's drive through And I, I, I'm okay saying that I don't feel like those foods have any place in our diet. Um, I think that um, for me, as you guys know, real food first, and then from there we make other choices, um, which we can figure out what works for each and every one of us. But um, yeah, I think it's okay. It's, it's okay to, that we all figure out what's, what works for each of us. But the science is good to know. It's good to understand how these things work in our body. So if you're just tuning in, you can rewind. And I talked about glycogen and glucagon, and I talked about um, what role the central nervous system plays in all that, um, and talked about uh, the hormone like the prostaglandins, the hormone like substances in our body that control inflammation and anti-inflammation, and the connection to um, essential fatty acids. So you can rewind to watch all of that if you were just tuning in. Uh, I'm going to sign off now and um, enjoy this snow day with my family. Um, but yeah, just remember, it's really interesting to understand the science and how our body works because when we have basic knowledge of what happens under the hood, we can make better choices for ourselves based on that knowledge. And it's incredible because they don't teach us this stuff in school. They don't even teach us how, the basics of digestion, not really. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about digestion another day. That'll be another good live. Um, I have a lot of fun things about digestion um, and the importance of hydrochloric acid. Stomach acid is good for you, but that's a story for another day, guys. Um, have a really good one and happy Thursday.